complexity uh, is the same thing, only now I say, uh, when I have a group of neurons together, according to some grouping scheme that I've defined, when any of them turn on, I say that counts as a non-zero, and I don't care about anybody else in the group. So once one group turns on, I don't care about the other neurons. They can turn on or off or whatever. Uh, it's fine. Uh, but I care about minimizing the number of groups that have non-zero neurons in them. So this is just another prior about uh, how we think neurons ought to behave and what makes good features. Uh, the really neat thing about this is that if you do that sparse autoencoder, if you do this tutorial, take that sparsity penalty and throw it away and drop this one in its place, uh, you get features that look like this. Uh, so what ends up happening is that as a result of defining groups that are little uh, square regions in, the, in a grid, uh, this algorithm figures out that to make groups sparse, I should put similar features with each other. Because similar features, like edges that are nearby, are all going to turn on together and turn off together. Uh, and so if you want to find features that minimize those objectives, it turns out that this is the way to organize. Uh, and a pretty neat idea is that if I take the max of, say, a bunch of neurons close together in the system, I get a little invariant edge detector. Uh, and so a lot of people feel that this is very similar to a complex cell in the brain. So there's lots and lots of cool stuff uh, going on back here. So you can think of uh, this algorithm as not only inventing edge detection, like we sort of think might be happening in the brain, but it's actually figuring out how to group edges together so that if an edge shifts, uh, it doesn't bother your features. So you can see how this kind of embodies that idea of invariance that we thought was a good idea. And a lot of the research that goes on in this field of figuring out feature learning is to say, if invariant features are a good idea, how do I come up with things like group, group sparsity so that when I minimize that objective, I get the invariant features that I want? So kind of coming up how to phrase that problem is the tricky part. Uh, but mechanically speaking, if you want to implement this algorithm, again, just think of it as a neural network, the same thing we've been talking about the whole time, some objective I want to minimize, gradient descent and back problem. All the same toolkit, all the same debugging systems, all the same initialization strategies, it's all sort of one little ecosystem uh, of tools. Uh, so finally, uh, I'll just sort of jump ahead here. Um, I'll say a word about pre-training. Uh, the strategy that I just told you about to find these features, uh, it turns out that if you have a bunch of labeled data, but you can't get your neural network to sort of initialize correctly, like you keep getting stuck and you get bad results, like maybe you're using sigmoid nonlinearities for some reason, a neat thing to do is use these unsupervised algorithms to train a bunch of layers and then do supervised training. Uh, and it's true that you're gonna sort of overwrite all the stuff you learned during the unsupervised training, but the neat thing is that that unsupervised training kind of initializes you to features that are already pretty good. Uh, and it turns out that on a lot of real problems, if you use this as your initialization strategy, uh, you can actually do quite a bit better. Uh, and this trick uh, is one of the things that got us all to believe a few years back that we could actually train really deep networks. Before, we sort of thought, it's too hard, keep running into problems, local minima, things like that. But once uh, Jeff Hinton and Yoshio Bengio and a few others tried uh, this trick of initializing things with unsupervised learning, uh, that sort of opened up uh, the field again. Um, finally, you might ask, uh, what do these features look like at higher levels? We talked about like edges. Uh, so there's been a little bit of work trying to figure out how do you learn, you know, second, third layer features and so on. Uh, many of you may know uh, the results from Google about a year ago. A huge, huge neural network, like a billion parameters. Uh, and you go poking around in those features at the very top of the neural net. Uh, and it's actually based on objective functions, not very different from the ones we just talked about. Uh, you can find neurons, for instance, that turn on whenever you see a cat uh, with, with a certain probability. They're not very accurate detectors, but they're much better than guessing. Uh, and you can kind of visualize them, uh, what it is that they respond to, and it turns out that they respond to a pattern that looks a lot like a cat. Uh, similarly, you can find neurons that turn on every time there's a human face, because if you want to represent images, you want to have sparse features that don't turn on too often and so forth, it turns out you should have neurons that detect faces. Pretty cool idea. You can discover these things without ever, <coughs> ever being given a label or ever being told what a face is. They're pretty amazing uh, early results. Um, I've done a little bit of this myself using a completely different type of algorithm, uh, but it turns out, once you dig into it, to be doing something very similar. 
uh, and you can actually find neurons in that system too uh, that are pretty sh surprisingly good faces, face detectors. Uh, so if you have a data set of say 50 million or 100 million patches where about maybe a hundredth of a percent or so of them are faces, you can find neurons in there uh, that can just go through and start picking out faces like nobody's business. Uh, so for example, uh, here are a whole bunch of patches that cause one of these neurons to activate and they're just all faces. Actually quite a good detector. Um, and if you think that it's cheating, like it's just picking up like eyeballs or something, uh, you can look through here and there is actually no discernible pattern that I can pick up that it's queuing on. Uh, for example, there's a stormtrooper in here somewhere. Um, there's all kinds of like cartoon faces that look like a Santa Claus in the corner. Uh, it's not clear to me at all <laughs> what is the sort of cheat that this thing could be using to pick these up. Uh, it's actually quite surprising how we bust it. How about the, the face of storm, the very sandy? Yeah, so we've tried that. Uh, so this paper from Google shows that if you take a face and you rotate it a little bit, this neuron will stay on for a little while before turning off. Um, it's not totally clear, uh, partly because we don't have great databases at this point with faces in different directions, but um, it's pretty, pretty interesting. Um, so this is pretty early work. Uh, it's a lot of things uh, about this that uh, are sort of incomplete, um, but it seems to say that a lot of the unsupervised learning principles that we've got are, are doing pretty interesting things. They're finding interesting stuff in the data without <coughs> being told. Uh, yeah, these patches are like 32 by 32, um, like each of these little faces here. So this is a pretty small scale. These images uh, are like 100 by 100. Is it because it's part of your focused on that part of Oh, yeah, the fact that this is in the center. Well, you know, I mean, you can pick the size of this. So ignoring this, so these two images are basically inputs into a neural network that would cause a certain neuron to turn. Uh, and this is from a separate piece of work where each of these little patches is one image. Um, so I think we got to jump here in a small number of minutes. So let me make sure there's nothing else really awesome in here. Uh, okay, no. <laughs> so uh, basic summary, supervised deep learning. Uh, if you've got a whole bunch of data, you just want to make some quick progress, actually works really great. We've got a lot of good tools, lots of people you can talk to uh, to get this working. Uh, unsupervised deep learning. Uh, Pre-training is a pretty cool trick that actually seems to help uh, in practice. Um, but how to get to really useful high-level features without any labeled data, that's still an interesting problem. Like how do we do that? How does the brain do that for that matter? Um, that's sort of interesting stuff. If you're interested in deep learning research, that's a pretty neat area. Uh, finally, uh, when I give you all these slides uh, up on the web, uh, you'll be able to go through here. We have a tutorial at Stanford you can work through. You get to build a CompNet and a sparse autoencoder and stuff in MATLAB, uh, which is a lot of fun. Uh, but there's a ton of resources now uh, on these algorithms and tutorials, so you can play with them. Um, and a bunch of references. Oops, I'm off of my slides now. But there's also some software toolkits out there to get you started.